Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon and good evening to wherever, wherever in the world you're joining us from this morning. Um, welcome to this session on Pathways to Resilient Blue-Green Growth for Cities, which has been convened by a, a large variety of partners, including um, the Resilient Shift, Arab, the World Resources Institute, the Resilient Cities Network, the Living with Water Partnership, Shanghai Urban Construction Design and Research Institute, and the City of Addis Ababa. In today's session, we have a brilliant lineup of speakers from around the world. Ethiopia, the UK, China, Germany, and the Netherlands. And they are going to be exploring how cities can achieve resilient growth. Throughout the session, please add your questions to the chat on the Pathable website rather than the Zoom chat. These will be picked up later in the panel discussion. I'm going to kick us off this morning by highlighting the imperative for water resilience. The world is facing some unprecedented challenges. We know that the impacts of climate change will be felt heavily in the form of water. However, these impacts will vary drastically. In some instances, this will mean increased precipitation and flooding. In others, threats from rising seas and also drought. Urbanization is also a key stress that the world is facing. Urbanization puts increasing demand on our precious water resources and wastewater services, increases impermeable area, resulting in, in increasing severity of floods, as well as making more people, homes and businesses vulnerable to flooding. Later in this session, we'll hear from the Shanghai Urban Water Construction Design and Research Institute about the Shanghai Blue Green Master Plan. And on today's slide, I've shown a photo of Shanghai in 1987 and then again in 2013, just showing the stark difference um, in the urbanization of the city over that 15 year period. These are macro trends will result in increased flood risk. What if the 100 year storm happened yearly, where the past is no longer a predictor of the future? In recent years, we've seen significant flooding in Germany, China's Henan province, and this week in Tennessee in the US. We are also seeing an increase in drought and water scarcity. In 2018, Cape Town narrowly avoided day zero. And this week, we've heard about drought and water scarcity challenges in the Colorado River Basin. These challenges of drought and population growth can drive unsustainable human behaviours. For example, the over-abstraction of aquifers far beyond their replenishment rate, as well as ecosystem pollution with human, agricultural and industrial waste. These stresses really drive the imperative for cities and communities to improve their resilience. That is improve their capacity to provide high quality water and wastewater services for residents and protect residents and assets from water related hazards. It's important to recognize that resilience isn't a destination, but rather a journey of continuous improvement across the spheres of governance, finance, infrastructure, environment and citizens and communities. And there are multiple pathways cities can take with some following the well-trodden path of using traditional gray infrastructure, and then with a later emergence of retrofit green infrastructure. Whereas others, particularly in the global south, have the opportunity to take the technological leapfrog and pass the traditional drain city model, moving to an adaptive multifunctional infrastructure and urban design. Peer-to-peer -peer learning, like today's sessions and others during World Water Week between cities offers a great opportunity to improve resilience capacity globally. Water underpins many of our city systems from the economy to food and agriculture and energy and even culture and our sense of place. Rather than this being perceived as a risk or barrier this offers a great opportunity for us to deliver wider benefit through engaging stakeholders across the basin or watershed. 
The design with water philosophy shown on the screen promotes the concept that collaboration between stakeholders provides the opportunity to deliver integrated, regenerative, smart and resilient water systems. With governance and partnerships, policy and regulation, data and insight, and funding and resources as key enablers. Nature-based solutions are an excellent articulation of how collaboration can achieve broader outcomes. Rewilding our cities and catchments can bring benefits to the water system in terms of storing our precious water resources, slowing the flow to reduce flooding, and improving the quality of the water environment. But they can also provide much more. From regeneration and active travel in Clanethley in the top left hand corner, to providing habitats and biodiversity and being a space for reflection and health and well-being in busy New York City. In today's session, we will explore two approaches for improving resilience, which have at their core the design with water philosophy. One focusing on the role of collaboration and the other on the role of blue-green infrastructure. In our first presentation, we're going to hear from Louise Kennedy, who's a water and development specialist at Arup, about collaborative resilience planning. She's going to tell us about how the city water resilience approach has been used in 12 cities around the world to deliver water resilience action plans. Today, she's going to be focusing on the new re newly released Hull City Water Resilience Profile, which can be found on the Pathival site, as well as ongoing work in Addis Ababa and Kigali. In our second presentation, we're going to hear from Thomas Sargris, an associate at Arup, and Xiao Shen Ma from the Shanghai Urban Construction Research and Design Institute about the development of the Shanghai Stormwater Master Plan. These will be followed by a panel discussion with representatives from cities around the world. Katrin Brurak, the Global Director of Programs, Innovation and Impact for the Resilient Cities Network, We'll lead the panel discussion with Johanna Sameha from Addis Ababa City Resilience Project Office, Lee Pitcher from the Living with Water Partnership in Hull and East Riding, Xiao Shen Ma from the Sustainable Urban Construction Design and Research Institute in China, and Rogier van der Berg from the WRI Ross Center for Sustainable Cities. As a reminder, as we go through the session, please feel free to add your questions to the Pathable site chat. I hope you enjoy today's um, session, and I'm now going to hand over to Louise Kennedy to talk about collaborative resilience planning. Thank you, Louise. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining today. My name is Louise Kennedy, and today I will be providing an introduction into some of our work on collaborative resilience planning in cities using examples from three cities we've worked in over the last year. The focus of my presentation is the city water resilience approach and its adaptation for use in different contexts around the world. Next slide. Global water crises from flooding to drought are one of the biggest threats facing the planet over the next decade. The city water resilience approach helps cities build the capacity of their urban water systems and the water environment to endure adapt and transform in the face of new challenges. The CWRA helps cities to formulate a clear vision of what urban water resilience means to them and provides a plan for prioritizing key actions for enhancing resilience by providing detailed expert and stakeholder input to understand the water systems and the shocks and stresses they face, diagnose their water resilience vulnerabilities, provide an opportunity for knowledge sharing and awareness raising across a range of diverse stakeholders, as well as a basis for relationship building and alignment. It enables stakeholders and decision makers to develop a collective action, uh, in a basis for collective action, uh, investment and partnership to build urban water resilience and aligns them with ongoing actions to enhance water resilience. Next slide, please. The CWRA is a globally applicable framework built on principles that can be implemented in any context. This framework was developed through our work with an initial five cities, Cape Town, Mexico City, Miami, 
Amman, and Hull. These cities were chosen to reflect a range of geographies and challenges, as well as different shocks and stresses and governance models to inform a truly global network. This project of defining and building resilience has itself embraced a collaborative approach, not only with um, our project partners, but also with the Resilience Shift, SUI, OECD, and with the cities themselves. Having close partnerships has been absolutely fundamental to this work, and we have and can continue to see this as an iterative approach, a process of co-learning, testing, and refining. In the last year, we've worked with the Living with Water Partnership to develop a city profile for Hull, and with the World Resources Institute and Resilient Cities Network on three African cities as part of the Urban Water Resilience Initiative. The negative effects of climate change and other water-related shocks and stresses are disproportionately felt by lower income and vulnerable communities, irrespective of their location around the world. This applies as well when you consider in-country assessments of social inequality, as well as inter-country assessments. Over the last year, we've worked in three very different contexts. On the surface, similarities between each might not be apparent. However, the need to, to address the needs of the most vulnerable people in each city was the primary driver. Commonalities between the cities included their risk profiles, including their susceptibility to flooding, social and economic growth factors, including high unemployment and high levels of poverty, combined with population growth and increased housing demand, as well as being economic centers for their regions. Next slide, please. Different cities will have different capacities and the opportunities for implementing the CWRA will vary between contexts. The full wheel of sub goals for the CWRA was developed and tested on high and middle income countries. And so it was envisaged that not all the sub goals would be suitable for um, fragile or lower capacity contexts. However, the value of the CWRA is the holistic approach it encourages in evaluating city systems as a whole. Therefore, a subset of goals is needed for different capabilities that still allows for holistic evaluation of the cities. Four levels of the CWRA, as well as the original wheel, were determined, and for each level, a subset of indicators was selected. These subsets started with essential provision of wash, where a city needs to be able to cope with recent urban growth and current demand. At this level, a city aspires to have spare capacity in their urban systems, and minimal issues with water supply shortages and sanitation provision. At the other end, you have regenerative design, which uses all of the original sub goals. And at this level, the city is aspiring to utilize new and innovative technologies and takes a holistic approach to evaluating the urban system. These selected indicators allow us to prioritize focus areas for each city while identifying opportunities and challenges around urban water resilience. Next slide, please. We've now expanded the CWRA to cities across the world, including the three I will introduce today, Kigali, Addis Ababa, and, and Hull in the United Kingdom. Next slide, please. Well, at a glance, these three cities are hugely different. They all have common points around their risk of flooding, socioeconomic issues around livelihoods, and a need to meet the requirements of changing demographics. This year, we undertook the CWA in each of those locations in collaboration with city champions and other partners. The basic process for the CWA stayed the same for all locations, but the ways of engaging with stakeholders varied. In Hull and Kigali, we undertook a completely remote assessment and visioning process, while in Addis Ababa, we carried out a hybrid in-person and remote workshops. The resilience profile for Hull was delivered in January of this year and in Addis Ababa over this summer, while the process is still ongoing in Kigali. From all three contexts, we came away with some key uh, points. In all contexts, participation, especially for underserved and vulnerable communities, helps us to gain a shared understanding of the challenges and build a foundation for shared action. Without the engagement of vulnerable communities, we cannot ensure that actions are developed with the community instead of for them. To improve this engagement, we need to learn to adapt to different ways of engaging stakeholders, including tailoring communications for different groups. Complex government governance across catchments 
with overlap or gaps in responsibilities between agencies is a key issue in engaging closely with city champions to ensure a good understanding of basin dynamics is hugely important. In many cases, plans and strategies for the city may be in place, but the challenge is in jumping to implement these. There is a need for collaborative working groups from different cities and federal agencies to understand how implementation can be best facilitated. Flooding and other water-related shocks and stresses are a challenge for cities, but we need to be able to reframe these as an opportunity, particularly around livelihoods. Demonstrating the link between job creation and water resilience is key. And finally, an increased need for workers around water resilience means that capacity building with academic partners, city agencies, as well as schools and universities, as well as skills development is a crucial opportunity for cities to capitalize on. Next slide, please. Finally, I will leave you with this quote from our partners at the Living With Water Partnership. The need to address water challenges is greater than ever, but so is the opportunity to rediscover the positive role of water, its potential to shape a successful, resilient and sustainable city. Thank you, and I will now pass on to our partners from Shanghai. Thank you, Louise. I will spend a few minutes discussing the development of the Shanghai Stormwater Master Plan, and then I will hand over to Xiao uh, Shan Ma from SUC, who will discuss the implementation of the plan uh, on the ground. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I will start by setting the scene. Uh, Shanghai has seen rapid urbanization population growth uh, over the last 30 years. Um, its population has grown from 15 million in the early 90s to over 24 million in 2020. Uh, Shanghai's urban area is also eight times larger than in the mid uh, 80s. As a result, uh, Shanghai faces several uh, complex drainage challenges. Uh, back in 2017, uh, the Shanghai drainage master plan was about 10 years in the making and its aim was to contribute to what it is in a very ambitious city development master plan by reducing urban flooding and first flash water pollution in rivers and canals. Uh, the Water Bureau's original plan uh, attempted to achieve these goals using a predominantly grey infrastructure. Uh, this was a combination of three large tunnels, uh, about 10 smaller tunnels, uh, but also detention tanks and two stormwater treatment plants. Uh, these investments had a total cost of approximately $43 billion by 2035. In this, par in this particular plan, uh, the use of nature-based solutions was only recommended as a last resort. Um, it was then when uh, the mayor of Shanghai at the time challenged the proposed plan due to its high cost, um, lack of adaptability to the threat of climate change, and also limited opportunity for the public to participate in addressing stormwater issues. We were engaged by the city authority in late 2018 to initially explore alternative stormwater strategies and eventually um, deliver. Um, a master plan over a period of 10 months. Uh, next slide, please. Our planning strategy identified three, uh, sorry, four, actually, uh, key interconnected systems, uh, governance, green, blue, and gray infrastructure. We propose that interventions must be implemented across all these systems for a successful uh, stormwater uh, strategy. Firstly, uh, governance interventions included enforcement of planning guidance and design standards, uh, education programs, uh, implementation of maintenance programs, and also reinstating the combined and separate drainage system to its original capacity. Uh, secondly, we recommended that nature-based solutions should be explored and tested in demonstration projects. 
Uh, also, a monitoring program uh, should be implemented to assess the performance of these um, green infrastructure solutions. Uh, thirdly, an integrated water model that covers the entire water and wastewater system was proposed. Um, the model actually enabled optimization of the existing network, uh, rivers and canals system, and also helped in the identification of opportunities for improved uh, stormwater management. Uh, finally, we recommended that any remaining needs for flood protection and water quality improvements should be addressed by grey infrastructure, but as such as tunnels and localized storage tanks. Next slide, please. So in terms of developing the plan, a detailed analysis was undertaken to understand the urban design and development context. Following a review of the study area, uh, the city was divided into 12 separate uh, typologies. Uh, we then used uh, satellite data and machine learning techniques uh, to rapidly analyze the whole study area and characterize the city districts. Uh, this created a valuable data set, uh, which was then used to assess the impact of possible stormwater management strategies across uh, the study area. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this slide provides a summary of the interventions we explored for this master plan. As you can see, they range from restoring the existing network to its original capacity uh, to several green interventions, uh, optimization of the river network, and also new grey assets, um, such as tunnels and some of the localized storage solutions. Next slide, please. Um, the final solution, as you have probably guessed, was uh, an integrated um, green, blue and grey infrastructure plan, uh, with a priority, though, given to nature-based solutions first. Uh, the master plan uh, was tested uh, by undertaking deep dives in three districts and also street level modeling to demonstrate uh, that uh, the, um, the proposed solutions work um, hydraulically um, at micro level. Uh, if we move to, to the next slide, please. Um, the revised master plan and the addition of nature-based solutions uh, negated uh, the need for a number of tunnels, reducing the projected cost of the plan from uh, $43 billion to approximately uh, $23 billion by uh, 2035. Um, I, will then, I will now hand over to Xiao Shan Ma, who will discuss the initial implementation of the plan and some of the challenges uh, faced to date. Faced to date. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Xiao Shema from Sectory. I will represent my team to share our works about implementing Shanghai Style Motor Mass Plan. Shortly after Shanghai Style Motor Mass Plan took effect in June 17, 2020, 16 districts in Shanghai began to work on their district style motor planning. In accordance with the master plan, three districts have been making faster progress, which our team participated in the planning work for. Planning for Huangpu District, Xuhui District, and Pudongnil District have been reviewed by professional experts and will take effect soon. Uh, next page, please. Here is our case in district planning. The first picture shows flooding risk and a five-year event of the area. We added green and blue infrastructures at three locations, indicated by green circles here. Then we modeled our plan, and the results are in the second picture. Flooding risk has been eliminated. Next step, we still need to see how they work after construction and during operation. Next slide, please. What? 
We also match challenge when implanting blue and green infrastructures. The first and the most important one is the limitation of land use and inner road space. Shanghai City Master Plan took effect in 2018, specifies the type of land use. The new stormwater master plan requires green blue infrastructures to be made in not just land specified for sewer facilities, but all types of land, including residential land, business land, etc. Not just in the plans, but also in the existing urban area. It is very hard to find suitable place and space to put our infrastructures. When placing infrastructures and the road, we realized roads are already full of lines, including gas information, electricity, etc., leaking room for our infrastructures. Due to the limitation of land use and inner road spaces, we may not put our infrastructures just in the flooding area, which is the optimized solution. We can only put one nearby where there is space. It works, but less cost effective. Uh, next slide, please. Another challenge is about downtown renovation. The construction of infrastructures impact neighborhoods such as the barriers on streets, the noise, the air quality. Plans are optimized again to minimize the impact on residents. Need to specify where and when to construct, how to construct. Next, please. Through these years, we continuously improve our strategies and here are our thinkings and future work. More and more authorities notice the importance of collaborative planning. Collaboration with other plannings is also significant, like urban planning, transportation planning, green space planning, comprehensive pipeline planning, etc. If land or space for green and blue infrastructures is pre-reserved in these plannings, it will be easier for us to place infrastructures. Also, this avoid huge work demand of moving, reconstructing, and retrofitting of existing facilities. Relative agencies and departments need to work together. Negotiation is necessary, and compromise may also be needed for better implementing. In the future, we will continue implementing our master plan to design and construct the infrastructures, to see the results and review our strategy, continuously improve our strategy for better performance. Maybe next time, our team can share how the infrastructures actually work and how we improve our strategy. About is all of my sharing today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Louise. Thank you very much, Louise Shaoshen, for your very insightful, your very insightful presentations. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Katrin Bruback, who's going to take us and moderate us through the panel discussion. Um, Katrin is a director from the Resilient Cities Network um, and has been involved in much of our work um, in the city water resilience approach um, right from the outset. And she has been a really valuable partner. And so I'm looking forward to a very exciting um, discussion, Katrin. Thank you. Thank you, Louise, um, for handing over to me. It's a huge pleasure to be with you this morning. Um, and um, I, have, I have the pleasure to moderate a panel of some amazing people I had the chance to work with over the last years building on um, some great presentations. Thank you so much for setting the scene. Um, um, I would like to start um, with Johannes. Um, Johannes, uh, you're the water person in the Addis Ababa Resilience Office and have been deeply involved in building the resilience strategy for Addis Ababa. Um, from your perspective, what is the role um, of blue green infrastructure in resilience building in the city of Addis Ababa? And um, what do you, from your perspective, what are the benefits it delivers to resilience of the city? Okay, thank you, Catherine. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Johan Sama. I'm working for at Saba C3 Resilience uh, Project Office. Uh, we have uh, developed the resilience uh, strategy last year. And, uh, and the blue-green uh, infrastructure uh, has uh, many benefits for uh, 
resilience. Resilience is uh, passing through or adapting the shock and distress, the blue green uh, infrastructure uh, with hold uh, many uh, shocks and distress. Uh, to mention some uh, climate change, it could uh, uh, manage for a, a climate change, uh, both mitigation as well as an adaptation, including uh, mitigating the floods, uh, reducing the urban heat. Uh, it helps for the, the uh, water cycle to uh, infiltration of the water to the ground, to uh, recharging the groundwater uh availability uh, it's also providing green space uh for the public the uh, addis has uh, major uh challenge on that but due to the uh, newly infrastructure uh blue green infrastructure it could reduce the uh, green space that needs to be uh provided for the city so uh, in conclusion it has uh, multi uh, uh, social economical and environmental uh, benefits having the uh, blue green infrastructure thank you thank you so much johannes um lee i would like um to ask you the same question um recognizing that uh, hull is very very different than as it others um could you talk about um how green blue infrastructure actually benefits your city and the resilience building in your city most definitely i mean what, what we see globally and what we've talked about today um is very much what we see impacting us at a local level as well so we know that of the 100 city, uh, resilient cities across across the world, 60% of them, you know, are the, the biggest impact for them uh, in terms of shocks or stresses, having too much or too little water. We see that across the planet over the last couple of decades, 2 billion people, you know, almost a third of our population of the globe have been in fact impacted by, by flooding indirectly or directly. And if you bring that global picture uh, with the the increased context of climate change and this this period that we're in of, of of the need for you know the greatest accelerated change in in human history, and bring that to Hull, where we've got three hundred thousand people, um, a city where we saw some of the facts earlier, um, where you know all of it sits within ten meters AOD of the water table. Um, you know, 100% of the city uh, within 10 meters AOD of the water table. And, and the fact that where it sits over on the east coast of Yorkshire, it has such an important part to play um, nationally for the UK. So 14% of UK international trade comes from the Humber ports. Um, it actually drains 20% of England's, of England's water through that Humber area. So it has such a crucial part to play. It's also a real hub for industry. Um, you know, it supplies a huge amount of uh, materials and supplies for our NHS, our National Health Service. And you know, that's that couldn't be more important right now when we're when we're facing a global pandemic. Uh, and of course, the, the problem in Hull is that um, it, it has the threat of uh, estuarial flooding, groundwater flooding, fluvial, pluvial. Um, and therefore, with the, uh, with the, as I say, with the context of, of climate change and the potential of sea level rise, it, it, it's just sat there and we need to do something really, really quickly with that risk. So blue-green planning, blue-green interventions are hugely important to us. Master planning for this city, not just for now, but for the future and future generations is really, really key. And those blue-green interventions, whether they be you know, new lakes, ponds, urban meadows, all of them have the ability not just to have a practical um, benefit in terms of reducing flood risk and pro providing peace of mind to all of those residents, but what those blue-green interventions do, they provide areas of new biodiversity. They create areas that people want to walk around. They create areas where people want to live. And what that means is Hull, not no longer is a place where people are or feel they are under threat from the water but it's a place where people can enjoy it where they can thrive on it where people want to live where people want to work where people want to come and visit 
So that's why blue green interventions are just so important to us in terms of resilience. Thank you so much. So what I'm what I'm hearing from both of you is that, um, and I think this is a super important part of building resilience. It's not only about reducing risks and vulnerabilities and talking about hazards and shocks and stresses, and it's all it's also about making a city better, making a city more exciting, making a, a city more livable and um, more beautiful for the residents that um, are uh, living there and for the people who are working there. Um, we, we talked um, and heard before uh, a little bit about enablers and barriers um, in, in the context of um, designing as well as implementing blue green infrastructure. Um, I would um, move um, to Chao Chan. Um, um, we heard quite a bit from you already in your presentation. From, from your perspective, what, from your what perspective, is the, what the greatest is enabler, the, greatest the biggest is. barrier um, you have been facing or you think to implement and design blue-green infrastructure? Okay, yeah, as I mentioned in my slides, the government realized our city needs blue and green infrastructures to be safe and clean as well. Now, most departments are in efforts to implement blue and green infrastructures, and difficulties for us is in three aspects. As I mentioned in my slides, the first is planning need to update, and the second is more optimized techniques and plans during construction to reduce impact on residents. And the third one, uh, I think maybe is the maintenance of blue, blue green infrastructures in the future. We still need to train the, uh, the training of specialized crews to maintain the infrastructures during operating. Yeah, that's what I think is the difficulties for us now. Thank you so much. Roger, um, Thank you, so you, much. Are, Roger um, you are, I'm sorry, I was just hearing myself. Um, Roger, um, you are working with a lot of cities around the globe. Um, um, from your perspective, um, looking at the implementation and um, the design of blue-green infrastructure in the context of um, urban planning, as well as um, resilience building in cities around the world, where, where do you see the enablers and um, barriers? And, I would be really interested to get your view specifically moving um, um, into the direction of how cities finance um, these infrastructures and what you see um, the, the issues are around um, these aspects. Thanks, uh, Catherine, and thanks for this uh, the great, uh, the great discussion uh, that we had. Maybe first about the enablers, because we in this discussion take it for granted that cities play a leading role in, in, you know, in creating resilience, which is actually not the case. Eh? We're here city to, sitting together with people that understand it and work in cities, but you know, the water space and the nature space is not necessarily you know, in the center of attention and on the, in the mandate of, of, of cities. So first of all, the enablers are the cities themselves. It requires real bold city leadership and action to look at you know, the ecosystem, at the water system at large, um, and not as an add-on. So that's the first uh, thing. And the water space is you know, scattered, really scattered around wash, water resource management, climate, and that sits with different departments at different levels of government. So a new role for cities and city leaders to play and to take action and to you know, take leadership is, is very important. And of course, that cannot go without tools without the right data analytics to make the right decision. So let me first say that because I think it's a very important, important message. So then I think it's important it's, and we've seen this in the presentations and also kind of Lee addressed this already that, you know, you need to take a more strategic approach, you know, nature and water is not an add on, you know, that's the time that we've had, you know, it's the kind of a really a new way of thinking how we create benefits for citizens through larger infrastructure investments to combine gray and green approach. So that's, so, and then how do you move from the strategic approach to projects? That's, um, that's, a, that's a very complex, complex process. So to say something about financing and maybe we can articulate that a little bit further later on. I think it's very important that there are kind of more uh, nature-based, specific nature-based solution pro project preparatory facilities. I mean, it's very complex to, we talked about, you know, the triple dividend, the many benefits, but not all benefits are monetary. So 
how can we develop uh, uh, business cases uh, um, uh, to advance uh, these type of projects. And we have been working on this specific nature-based solutions uh, project recovery facility. So that is one thing. So the process bringing actors together and thinking around the business case of these projects. But there is a couple of kind of interesting uh, projects that we are involved in with WRI um, around you know, um, innovative financing mechanisms. Um, green bonds that we are currently you know, uh, piloting and testing through our Cities for Forest network. But also um, what we are piloting in the US, for example, on a joint benefits authority, how you can bring actors together to develop nature-based solution and to kind of share the benefits from it. So these are a couple of um, 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 uh, uh, things. I think the last thing that I want to say, and then um, I, 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 back to you, Catherine, the last thing I want to say is that, um, and, and we've been with the Urban Water Resilience Project in Africa um, and, 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 and in partnership with RCN and, 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 and with the Resilient Shift. We've seen that we, if we really want to advance this, this, this nature-based solutions and urban water resilience, we need funds and investments at large. Um, and therefore kind of new, not only new you know, financing mechanisms, but what are the catalytic funds and opportunities to unlock much more private and domestic finance in this space. Um, I think that's an important, uh, this is something that we're currently explore with partners, um, a way to kind of incentivize private sector investment in this space um, is, is, is really important, but the um, challenge is huge. So we cannot just, as I said, I repeat once more, it cannot be an add-on, it's a structural new way of looking at cities and financing cities. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I think there were amazing um, points being made. I would like to take one, one out because we heard um, um, from Shanghai and we heard actually about cost savings, what you are saving. It's not about only cost savings on one side, which there potentially is an opportunity, but it's also about monetizing the infrastructure and assessing infrastructure and business models in a different way. And um, that means that you start to think about potentially also about how you monetize in, uh, in a theoretical way, all the benefits the infrastructure brings, which are not cost savings in, in, in design or in infrastructure construction. Um, I think that is, that is um, a very important point we are seeing from the work with our cities. And there needs to be a lot more uh, focus on how do we actually do um, cost benefit analysis and how do we actually match them with the infrastructure solutions, either green or green, blue or gray infrastructure, and how do we compare and take decisions based on that. Um, I would like to go back to you, Lee. Um, we heard um, a lot about what is necessary, and you are certainly a, a water champion in the city, so um, I'm allowed to say you are not only a water, but a water city champion leading um, the work um, with the water utility in very close partnership with the city, um, which is like we heard from Roger the way it should be, uh, or we would like it to be. Um, looking at um, your city and your utility and, and looking about what skills are important. So what do you, what do you see from a utility perspective? How can you develop the skills and how can you develop employment opportunities around the supply chain and to, to actually deliver on nature-based solutions to deliver on um, blue-green infrastructure. Uh, thank you, Katrine. Yeah, you know, it's a it's it's a real opportunity here, isn't it? So for the next for the next 10 years, we are we are going to be the the, the people that actually define the future. So the people that currently for the last 20, 30 years of their career have already been working um in civil engineering in design in landscaping um who have used traditional methods um so new sewer systems pumps um big new sewage works um you know that that has all played its part in terms of getting to where we've got to today and, and, and to be honest the service pretty well hasn't it um over many many years but we've also got this um we've also got a new generation coming through of, of children who um, have an absolute passion. You can see that every single day um, if you look across social media in terms of what, what they think about climate change and the important role that they will play in the future, um, both, both in terms of 
what they can do themselves, but how they could influence some of the older generations as well. And I think what we need to start to think about now for the next 10 years is how we, how we use mindsets and behavior change to really influence how we educate and provide the tools and techniques that we're gonna need in the future. So that traditional engineering that we've known, the STEM subjects that we've known that have been taught in schools, in colleges, at universities, will hold us in good stead. But those, those now need to move and adapt to think about nature-based solutions, solutions where we're working at one with our environment. And that does require a real difference in terms of skill set. Um, and we've seen already, we've seen already. So in terms of the, the master planning that we're doing, in terms of the design that we're doing of some of our infrastructure that we're putting in place, reaching out and finding um, partners, people in the supply chain that can offer the design, the landscaping, the physical building and implementation of Blue Green, the ongoing maintenance. Well, that, that doesn't tend to be there in one place at the moment. So there's a real niche opportunity right now to, to create uh, new apprenticeships, um, new uh, university uh, uh, clusters all around blue green infrastructure and a different type of technological design that's going to hold us in good stead for the future. And, and that to me is really, really exciting. It's a huge opportunity. Thank you so much. Um, I have I have one more question because we, um, as you heard, uh, as you heard um, from Louise, so we are currently um, doing um, the, the water resilience assessment in Kigali, and one major takeaway of our um, first visioning exercise to come up with actions um, was around skills development, um, which I had the chance to moderate last week and. Um, the interesting part um, of like all the engineers that were sitting in my group, um, um, all water people was, you know, um, I think we don't have the right skills here to, to develop resilience. And there was very much a strong, um, strong focus on nature based solutions. You know, we also need these lawyers and, and the urban planners and, and maybe we also need um, sociologists, you know, like building resilience is so much broader. It's not only about engineers. It's not about infrastructure it's about like you said behavior change um how do you see um your role in in collaborating and attracting also people from from outside the engineering space and uh, do you see a role there so what what does the what does the city and the sector need to attract this young talent that is um and i i couldn't agree more excited while also being feeling threatened um, by the future they're looking towards too yeah, I mean, we've, we've talked about it before already today. So strategic leadership of, of the city, of the area is massively important because that's a, that's a key enabler that creates that spark that's required in order to uh, start to think differently um, in, a, in an area. I think that we've got, as I've said, a, a, you know, a whole generation of really enthusiastic, excited children um, who want to be part of something different um as well so for me um uh, you know the, the 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 need for the city to help enable and create the infrastructure the the, the different types of education the um involvement of blue green in the curriculum really early um in schools um the ability to create college courses that attract new apprenticeships as i've said before all of that for me is, is really important here and, and will drive, a, drive that change going forwards into the future. Thank you so much. Johannes, um, I hope um, you're, you're able to, to come in again. Um, in Addis Abeba, um, the engagement process with all the stakeholders, bringing the right people to the table as part of the water resilience assessment we carried out there was, wasn't, wasn't easy. Um, so how, how do you see um, um, from the city perspective in Africa, the, um, the, the importance around governance and stakeholder involvement and listening to communities in the context of resilience planning? Kitrin, I'm afraid we may have lost Johannes um, due to, I think, unstable Wi-Fi. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Okay, Roger, that's now uh, putting you on the stage. 
So, so we, 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 heard, we heard about, um, uh, we heard about co benefits, we heard about um, um, financing and, and the need for innovation. Um, looking at um, the looking at society, looking at governance, looking at the water sector, which is incredibly complicated, um, especially in African cities, but also looking at cities and city systems. Um, what what from your um, perspective is um, the importance around stakeholder participation, um, bringing um, communities voices into the discussion. What are, what are the main recommendations um, you, you can give from your work and your experience? Well, I think, um, <clears throat> I think um, we all know how important it is to bring different stakeholders together. I mean, this, 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 this is a too complex of a challenge. I mean, especially in the Urban Water Resilience Initiative in Africa, we see actually the research that we've done and the, the report that we published in, in, in July on pathways for uh, resilience in, in African cities shows that there's a huge amount of stakeholders that can play a role in establishing and driving nature-based solutions, bringing different innovative solutions around water to communities that don't play a role. And, and I got back to the financing question that can't tap into kind of financial resources to do their job right. So um, I think what's very important is, and I talked a little bit about the need for this kind of catalytic funding that can unlock um, finance to finance the right stuff. Lee, you already said we need a different approach. So this is not about engineering. We talk about bankable projects. No, no, we need to find, we need to finance different stuff, you know, different project, the right stuff. So that's for, and to do that, we need also really a different type of actors. I mean, there's a huge opportunity um, in youth, in entrepreneurial activity, and there's an army of social entrepreneurs in, in Africa that can help to advance and to bring finance where it needs to go, to vulnerable communities in city. And the question is uh, then how, how do we connect these groups of people and um, providing them access to finance that comes from international and national and, 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 and city resources. City resources are very limited. So the, really the question is to, to how to make the connection and how to make them tap into these funds to, 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 to work in order to advance this, uh, this solution. So it's not only about participation and bringing stakeholders together, it's really rethinking the opportunities to access finance and to really drive a whole new army of entrepreneur youth to help us to achieve, uh, achieve that. And then maybe the last thing, last thing that I want to say, because I think everybody touched upon it, but I think it, it needs to be really articulated that, you know, the analytics around kind of risk informed planning, you know, and how it overlaps with the vulnerable communities in cities is very important because I mean, in the end, you know, you need to take a kind of evidence-based decisions um, um, and therefore this kind of very rapid analysis um, at city level to guide um, finance and projects into the right, you know, in the, into the right spaces of, 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 of urban areas is, um, is key. Sorry, I stop here. I'm, I, I can, you, you get me started now and you're almost in no, the end I, of the I know, session, we, we most probably need, uh, need to continue. You know, now, now like also everybody is like getting warm. It's now towards like seven or eight o'clock in the morning so we can continue. <laughs> um, Johannes, it's, it's great to have you back. I hope your um, connection is stable enough. We were, we were just talking about the, the role of stakeholder participation and, and listening to different voices. Um, unfortunately, uh, we lost you. Is there anything you would like to share from the extensive process um, you um, um, implemented in Addis Ababa as part of the, the water resilience and the resilience work um, with the audience? Okay, uh, regarding to the public participation, Addis has uh, been very uh, participative in the uh, process of uh, resilience strategy also the resilience uh, the city water assessment preparation uh, we uh, followed uh, a door to door survey to uh, households identified uh, and to the vulnerable uh, groups of households so that 
to identify which shocks and stress are uh, highly uh, visible to uh, those. And also a uh, key informative interview has been held with uh, different government uh, office uh, representatives, uh, academics, and civil society workers and conducted a force uh, for, uh, who have a common share on uh, uh, different uh, risk, uh, shock and distress. And also we uh, conducted uh, a countless uh, workshop uh, based on the sector to the water sector, to the housing, to the flood, to the waste. We identified different thematics and we hold uh, different uh, workshops and that's where we uh, found much of the uh, actions need to be implemented for the strategy in Addis Ababa uh, from the people, from the participants and also the solutions and the problems that been, came from the uh, residents of uh, Addis. That's how what the problem, the, the uh, participation. Thank, Thank you, you so much. So we are heading towards um, the hour. Um, I would I would like to first of all thank you all for participating in today's session. Um, the the key the key messages I heard um, over the last hour was uh, and I'm trying to summarize and please skip in if I'm, some, I'm missing missing something because most probably I'm also going to talk for the next thirty minutes. So we what we heard is collaboration is key. So we can't, we can't do everything on our own. We have to, to listen to everybody who has anything to say. We, we need to recognize different needs. Um, Roger made the point three or four times. We need to understand our risks and vulnerabilities. Data um, is key. We heard about the, the CWA, which Hull implemented, which others implemented, which gives actually a good understanding what are the risks and vulnerabilities we are facing in our water sector. But it also, and I think that that is an important part, um, we also heard in between the lines, it's also about opportunities. So it's not only about um, uh, building water resilience or resilience to shocks and stresses is not only about risks and um, uh, vulnerabilities, it's also while identifying the solutions, no matter how they look like, if they are green, blue or gray, um, the, the opportunities we have, the co-benefits and to recognize that when we look for financing, when we start to think about how do we actually put this infrastructure in place. And I think that is, that, is, that is the part which is actually changing the way we are designing and looking at solutions. It's, it's not only how do I have to build a drain that drains the water away, we also need to think about how can we create this pleasant environment. Um, Lee has made the point, Johannes has made the point around nature-based solution, creating more than just stormwater retention or water solutions. It's creating a pleasant environment. It's, it's improving air quality. So it's about looking at resilience as a reduction of risks and hazards, but also at the vast uh, opportunities that resilience building in the context of the water cycle and in the context of the city actually provides. And, and based on that, we need to think about, and, and Roger, Roger made a, uh, made a uh, big point, and we heard about the capacity development and the skills development. There's a, there's a huge range of stakeholders that has a role to play here that need a, a voice that, that we need to listen to and to understand and bring into it the process of des designing and defining the solutions. Going back to the CWA, this is what we have been trying to do. We have been trying to bring people together to identify these solutions and build on that and take it serious what people are saying. And I think I think from, from our side, working with cities on resilience, this is what resilience is all about. It's, it's about solutions that address multiple benefits. It's about the right financing. It's about breaking down silos, bringing multiple voices into the con, uh, conversation. It's about working together and it's about making the world a better place and not only our cities. Um, thank you so much for today's session. It was a huge pleasure and I hope um, to see all of you um, anytime soon, latest next year in Stockholm, hopefully. Um, have a wonderful day ahead. Thank you very much. Have thank a you. Day. Thank you. Thanks so much.